Here's the mic. Sunrise Semester, Astro number 15, take one. Sunrise Semester, produced in association with Washington Square College of Arts and Science of New York University, presents The Heavenly Twins, Astronomy and Astrology, with Professor Engelbert L. Schucking. Before we shall discuss the motion of the planets in the skies, and as they appear from our vantage point on Earth, we should like to uh, take you through a brief tour through the solar system and conduct a sort of inventory of the planets. How do you recognize a planet? Well, in the evening sky, in these days, you can see the planet Saturn, and in the morning sky, you can see the planet Mars. How are they distinguished from all the other bright fixed stars? Well, if planets are not too close to the horizon, you can distinguish them with the naked eye from fixed stars by the fact that they do not twinkle. Stars twinkle, planets generally don't. The reason for that is that the major planets, or the nearby planets, appear as little disks, and <coughs> the light of a disk is not as much affected by the turbulence in the air that astronomers call seeing as the light of the stars which appears to come from a point. Naturally, stars are also disks, but they are so immensely far away that they appear practically as points. If we take you on this tour through the solar system, we should start with a view that we have here that gives you an idea of the relative sizes of the planets. You see here the planet Jupiter, which is uh, this big chunk of matter. Uh, about 10 times uh, as large in diameter as the Earth, and that means the volume is about a 1,000 times as large. The second biggest one is Saturn here, depicted without its well-known ring. Here we have as a sort of medium-sized planets, Uranus and Neptune, Neptune, while these smaller dots here are Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. We can also see the scale of the planets in this graph, which um, shows you the Sun drawn to scale with the planets. The red giant in the upper left hand corner is uh, Jupiter, here is Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And uh, these uh, uh, eruptions from the sun are prominences, uh, big uh, chunks of uh, hot gas that are thrown out by our central star. We have another picture here that gives you perhaps a better idea of the scale. It is taken from a delightful little book by H.A. 
Ray, the stars, which has many uh, quite instructive uh, graphs in it, and this is one. We have the sun here at the bottom, and uh, you can see that in this scaled down model, the sun is uh, still extremely, extremely large. You can hardly notice the curvature of the sun's surface. Now here, scale is uh, Mercury. It would be about 30 yards away from the sun in this model. More to the right, you have Venus, a ball that's a little bit, bit bigger, 56 yards away from the sun. Then here we go further out and meet Mars, 120 yards away from the sun. And uh, on we go to uh, Jupiter, which uh, <coughs> dwarfs all the other bodies in the solar system. Then we go further out to Saturn. And on from there to the outer planets, Neptune here and uh, <coughs> Uranus here. And here in the upper corner, we have Pluto, which on this scale is uh, <coughs> one and uh, three quarter miles away from the sun. If we study these bodies now individually, we uh, start out with uh, an artist's conception of the planet Mercury. You see the sun here hidden by some piece of volcanic lava. And out from the sun goes a disk of uh, luminous matter, which is known as the zodiacal light. Mercury is extremely hot. It uh, is a little bit larger than our moon, and uh, it's uh, very probably impossible for any Earth-like life to exist on this body. We have here a photograph of Venus, which <coughs> shows phases like the moon. It is uh, covered with a very thick cloud uh, uh, cover that does not let the sunlight through to the bottom. An artist's conception of Venus <coughs> shows a thunderstorm going on on Venus. It is, uh, the atmosphere is so thick that it gives rise to a tremendous distortion of all pictures. This planet is the hottest planet in the solar system. The uh, temperature at the surface is close to 900 degrees Fahrenheit. It is a real hellhole. The next planet is so well known to you that I don't have to mention its name. And we go further outward now to Mars. These are mariner photographs close up that show a part of Mars that looks similar to the moon with uh, many craters. Another close up shows the polar cap of Mars, which is here in the left-hand part of the picture. This is the limit of the polar cap, and it is a thin layer of uh, probably of uh, frozen uh, carbon dioxide, dry ice. This is another close-up of Mars. <coughs> And uh, we know this planet now very well. There are good maps of it. And here, this is the artist's view of the planet Mars here, illuminated by the sun. The sun com sunlight comes here from the right. And it is viewed from uh, a satellite 
of uh, Mars. Mars has two satellites, which are tiny chunks of matter. Phobos and Deimos is supposed to be Deimos. And here you see two astronauts. This is a picture that uh, space enthusiasts uh, foresee will happen in the future. And these astronauts are making jumps. The uh, gravity of this chunk of matter is not very large. And so one has to be careful if one throws things. One could very easily throw a uh, ball and would never see it again. It would not come back. But the gravity would be uh, good enough to uh, keep astronauts uh, from uh, falling off this planet if they make a jump into space. And on, on this guided tour through the solar system, we get now to Jupiter. In the upper left-hand corner, you see the so-called red spot of Jupiter, a, a permanent marking on its surface. In the, uh, near the top, you see the shadow of a moon of Jupiter. Uh, Jovians who sit right there would now observe a solar eclipse. The following picture shows you the moons of <coughs> Jupiter, the major ones, the large ones, all <coughs> lined up here, the so-called Galilei moons. They, <coughs> their orbits lie in this plane, and it is also <coughs> in this plane that the <coughs> equator of Jupiter is situated. Jupiter rotates about an axis like this, perpendicular to this line. We have another view here. Again, an artist's view, as an astronaut might see it from a moon of Jupiter. Jupiter will loom as a tremendous sphere in the skies, illuminating the landscape. Further out into the solar system, we come to Saturn, a planet so well known for its rings. This is a photograph taken with a big telescope. The view of the ring is different here. We see it almost edge on. You see the shadow that the ring casts here onto the uh, uh, surface of <coughs> Jupiter. On the right-hand side of the picture, you see a piece of the ring illuminated by the sun. If we see the ring exactly edge on, then it is uh, invisible. This is a view of <coughs> Jupiter from one of its uh, from uh, of Saturn <coughs> from one of its uh, satellites, Japetus. The uh, <coughs> satellite uh, is has an orbit that does not lie uh, exactly in the plane of uh, uh, the equatorial plane of uh, Saturn. And so we see from it the ring with a slightly opening. We do not see the ring edge on. If we go further out, oh, we have this picture also here, which is an artist's view uh, from a nearby moon of um, satellite of Saturn's. You see here the <coughs> ring in the uh, plane of uh, uh, the equator of uh, Saturn and the various other moons. Saturn has altogether 10 are uh, lined up here in various phases. The <coughs> this picture is, shows you 
Uranus with its satellites. It is vastly overexposed, so this is not the true size of the planet Uranus, which has a very curious feature that it rotates <coughs> about an axis which almost lies in the plane of its orbit. That means the seasons on Uranus are rather atrocious. Its period of uh, revolution about the sun is 84 years, and if it points its north pole towards the sun, it means that for 21 years the southern hemisphere will receive practically no sunlight. The artist's view here shows the planet as seen from one of its satellites. The uh, strange feature with the axis of rotation brings about the effect that the axis of rotation here would be situated like that. Usually if you see uh, phases of the planets, uh, you see the axis of rotation going approximately like this. And if we go further out, we have here a view of the planet Neptune, seen from one of its uh, satellites. Again, it looms as a huge sphere in the skies. And <coughs> Eventually, we have a view here that shows Pluto, a cave on Pluto, and through the opening of the cave, you see a very bright star, and this star is our sun. This ocean that you see in front may be liquid methane. The temperature on Pluto is so low that the gases that we have in our atmosphere, uh, oxygen and nitrogen, uh, <coughs> would all be liquefied, if not be solid. It is indeed a rather bleak, cold and lonely world out there on the planet Pluto. Let us then <coughs> view the system all together. On this graph, you see that, indeed, the inner planets, which we mean uh, Mercury, Venus, and, uh, and Earth, so to say, are extremely close together as compared with the huge scale on which the outer planets move. All planets, with the exception of Pluto, move very close to that plane that we have mentioned so often, the plane of the ecliptic, which is the plane in which the orbit of the Earth lies. This graph should give you an idea of the uh, behavior of the axis of rotation of the planets. It is not the newest graph, it does not give you the data for Mercury and for Venus. The axis of Mercury is, I believe, inclined by 7 degrees towards the equator, <coughs> towards uh, the uh, uh, axis of the orbit, and Venus, I believe, is 6 degrees. These measurements have been taken recently uh, by uh, uh, using the big radio telescopes. For the Earth, it's 23 and a half degrees. It's very similar for Mars. So therefore, the seasons on Earth and Mars, apart from uh, <coughs> their differences in length, uh, would be uh, very similar. Now, Jupiter is, uh, has an axis almost uh, 
coincident with the axis of its orbit. Uh, Saturn is also not uh, <coughs> that much uh, different, but the <coughs> great difference is here uh, at, in the case of Uranus. For Pluto, here to the right, we do not uh, know in uh, which position its axis of rotation is located. We have then a picture of a typical orbit, the planet, as you know, Kepler discovered the orbit of the planets about the sun are not circles, they are ellipses, and the sun is not positioned in the center of the ellipse, but in the focus of an ellipse. And let me therefore perhaps illustrate that on the blackboard, we draw an ellipse. We put the sun into the focus of the ellipse. And so perhaps I use the astronomical symbol for sun. And the planet, as seen from the northern hemisphere, moves in this sense about the sun. This point where the planet has the largest distance from the sun is called the aphelion. The point where the planet makes its closest approach towards the sun is called the perihelion. These words are formed with the Greek word for sun, which is helios. To describe how much the orbit of a planet deviates from circularity, we have the notion of eccentricity of a plan <coughs> planetary orbit. And this eccentricity is measured by the distance of the planet from the center of the ellipse. If we want to uh, describe it more mathematically, we call this distance from the center to the furthest point at the ellipse, the semi-major axis, semi-major axis, and if we divide this distance by the semi-major axis, we get the eccentricity, which is often described by the little Latin letter E. If E is zero, then the uh, ellipse degenerates into a circle, and uh, this is the case Indeed, for most of the planets, there are only two of them which have a uh, considerable eccentricity, the uh, planet Mercury and with an eccentricity of 20%, and the planet Pluto with an eccentricity of 25%. The <coughs> arrangement of the planets in space can be given roughly by using the distance from or the mean distance because the orbit of the Earth also has a slight eccentricity as a measuring stick. So we have the mean distance sun to Earth is called one astronomical unit. And then we can write the distance to Mercury, Mercury from the sun, as uh, is often called by the uh, letter A, and which is given by the semi-major axis of the ellipse, is equal to 0.387 
for Venus, it is uh, 0.72. For the Earth, it is 1. For Mars, it is uh, 1.52, I believe. For Jupiter, it is 5.2. For Saturn, it is 9.5. Five, you have then Uranus, uh, given by 19, I believe, uh, Neptune is given by uh, 30, approximately, and Pluto eventually is something like 39.5. Now, you may wonder, how does this series of numbers go on? Is there another planet beyond Pluto? The number of <coughs> astrologers have uh, conjectured that there are indeed further planets, that the solar system does not come to an end here. Astronomers have made uh, a number of attempts to find further planets out there, but it is an extremely difficult task because uh, you only have to realize that if a planet is ten times as far away from the sun, then it will receive only one hundredth of the <coughs> sunlight and since this planet will then also be 10 times further away from us, we, it will give off to us only a hundredth of its light. So altogether it would appear about 10,000 times fainter than it would at a normal distance. And uh, then it will be extremely difficult to distinguish this planet from the billions of stars that are in the skies, stars that are equally faint. And so one uh, need not give up hope that uh, there may be further members of the solar system out there. It will only be extremely difficult to find them. One has already given a name to this uh, <coughs> to the planet uh, which is supposed to be beyond Pluto. The planet has been given the name X, the fashion of mathematicians, and uh, during last year a concerted effort was uh, made to find the planet X. It had been predicted that it should be in the constellation Cassiopeia which is right in the Milky Way and extremely rich in stars. But uh, in spite of all these attempts, we have not been able to extend the size of the solar system. The uh, planet uh, X, therefore, is uh, still high on the priority list of the astronomers. Dr. Engelbert L. Schuching is professor of physics at Washington Square College of Arts and Science of New York University. For your assignment, please read Appendix 7 in A Time for Astrology by Jess Stern. For the book list for the Sunrise Semester courses, please write to Sunrise Semester New York University, New York, New York, 10003. New York University's participation is made possible in part by a subvention from the Sperry and Hutchinson Company.
This program is recorded. This is CBS.